I'd like to, I would like to uh, uh, explain why it took so long uh, between the first time we spoke about the world and this time. Uh, my mother uh, went to be with the Lord on the 11th of February. Uh, we are very thankful that she, uh, we know that she is the Lord. And number two, that she was 97 years old and she did not suffer. So this is uh, maybe an explanation why the it took me so long to uh, speak about this part of the uh, word that I would have liked to share with you close to the first part. However, I will uh, recap and make a fast um, summary of what we have said the other time. When we speak about the world, we know that God created the world in Hebrews, in Hebrews 11, 3, it says that through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. So it is God who created the world. However, this is not the the, the Lord God's creation what we see around us. It's completely corrupted because of sin. This is exactly the repercussions of sin. How did it start? It started when Cain left the presence of the Lord. It says in Genesis 4.16, and, and Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. As we said, Nod, it's, it is a word that speaks to us about despair, about uh, lost, being lost, no bearing. And actually, this could characterize the world very much at this time. The problem with Cain was that he had no sense of ruin. Everything was okay with Cain. And that's why he presented a sacrifice that had no blood. What's wrong with the fruit of the earth? But the earth was cursed, so everything that comes out of it is consequently cursed, but he did not had no had this notion, and he went out to build a city, and in this city or in this civilization, he guaranteed to have everything that would satisfy the soul, the mind, the body, the flesh. We saw the technology. We saw the uh, the professional uh, the professionalism, work hard work. We saw also the entertainment, just to address all man man's needs. One thing is not is missing though. In this circle, the headship of God. It even started polygamy which speaks to us of going contrary to the principle that God has laid down as the foundation of the family, for instance. One man, one woman, husband and wife, the two bodies, two, soul, two spirits and one body, they become one body. But this was not okay. For the people in at Nod, in that civilization, he wanted to have uh, so much lust and desire satisfied, and this is what uh, had 
Cain established over there. God, the Lord has condemned this circle because when he came to this world, he was rejected. Of course, this circle would reject him. It says in John 3, 19, and this is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. This is the case that people would reject everything that is God's way. They prefer to go with what they think is correct, what they think is right. The rationalization for everything, refusing or rejecting God's principle. However, when the Lord Jesus came to this world, he redeemed the world. It says in Romans 8, 21, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Romans 8, 21 and 22. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. There is no rest in this world. In that circle, there could be no rest because man, man's spirit will always feel empty without that satisfaction with this relationship with God. Man might be able to satisfy, satisfy it every now and then with one thing or the other, but at the end, there will be some kind of thirst, some kind of hunger that the world cannot provide. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should, what, should not perish but have everlasting life. God came to the world to redeem it, to, to give it everlasting life. But sadly, uh, this was not accepted. Now, the part we are speaking before we speak about the uh, our relationship with the Lord with the world, we need to uh, remember the warning and the admonition. The warning that James says in four four says, "Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore be a friend of the world is." the enemy of God. You can't have both. You have to choose one. Brother Norman Berry uh, once said that uh, if the world thinks that you are okay, then uh, you you'd better revise your behavior and your conduct. And I find this very true. If the world finds no, nothing uh, strange in your lifestyle, but sees the, the uh, conduct and the behavior of the Christian conforming completely to his conduct, then this would be an indication. It would be a symptom of a problem of uh, sickness. There is something missing there in the life of the believer. As for the admonition that John says in 1 John 2.15, he says, love not the world, neither things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 1 John 2.16, for, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. The world can go along with us in everything we say, everything we do. Actually, if there is anything that 
would characterize it is that everybody would do what pleases them and what is okay in their eyes, what is all right. Just like the time of judges, if you remember, we read that passage where it says that in that time of the judges, everyone did what is pleasant, when, what is all right in their eyes. And actually this is what characterizes the system that was built and was established by Cain without the headship of God, without the submission to his power and to his, uh, to his dominion. This world will continue whether there is a good season or a bad season, when there is economical depression or economical growth, where, when, if there is, whether there is COVID or whether there is Ukraine-Russian war, it will continue. It will live and it will take its course. On the 24th of uh, uh, February, uh, Russia started a war with Ukraine. Immediately the world forgot about COVID as if it was non-existent and started speaking about that. And now what the world is occupied with is the result of that war, whether it's the price of oil, whether it's the price of wheat, Egypt uh, is exporting a very large uh, part of its wheat uh, import from there. And also we have many tourists coming up from there. I'm talking about thousands of them. So this is the occupation. How would this affect me and how it will affect my pocket? That is what is important. But where is that occupation with God? It's not present at all. This is the only thing that is not there. It will continue its course until the Lord comes. Look at Luke 17, 28. Likewise, also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. Luke 17, 29. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Matthew 24, 37, 38. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered in the ark. This is the course that the world is taking and will continue to take as a system because that system has no headship of God in it. It has religion, it has food, it has everything a, a, a man desires. Only the headship is of God is uh, absent. So now the answer of the question, how, what is the relationship of the believer with the world? How would the believer should act with the world? I found out that the best way to speak about it is to take the example of what to do while studying the life of Abraham and what not to do while looking in contrast in the life of Lot. Let's see first what characterized, characterized the life of Abraham. Two things. Number one, the altar. Number two, the tent. 
these are the two character uh, uh, the uh, the two things or the two characterizations of the life of Abraham. Abraham was living in this world as a pilgrim, as a person who would stay in this world for a while, but he knows that this is not his uh, permanent stay, but it is a transition. And the best example that one that comes to mind is as a person who is an ambassador in another country. An ambassador in another country, he, number one, although he lives in, in uh, let's say, let's take the example of, uh, let's say, for instance, uh, uh, the Canadian ambassador living in Egypt. He lives in Egypt. He has uh, an, uh, a villa or an apartment. He buys his stuff from Egypt to eat, to, to consume. But he knows that it would be a very short period, and then he will leave Egypt. He, this is not a permanent, number one. He knows that he represents not the Egyptians, but he represents the Canadians in Egypt. He knows that this is temporary, and later he will have to leave Egypt to go and live in his own country. This is exactly the notion of Abraham. This was the behavior and the conduct of everyday life of Abraham. When we read in Hebrews 11 verse 9 about Abraham, we read by faith, Abraham, he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles, in tents, with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the promise of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. This is what characterized the life of Abraham. Abraham knew that it is not, it is only a transition and he is here for a while and he's looking forward to go to that city that God has built. So the, character, the character, characteristic of his life was a tent and an altar. In Genesis 12, 7, we see that, and the Lord appeared unto, and the Lord appeared unto Abraham and said unto, unto him, thy, unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and high on the east. And there he builded on an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. Again, this is, he pitched, he pitched his tent in a certain place. There where this was his temporary place. This was his address, just like the ambassador from Canada. But when he wanted to have a place to bury, to bury Sarah, he had to go out and buy a piece of land. Remember the story. He, he insisted on paying. He had... Abraham was a wealthy man. We know that, that when he had that fight, he had, he had a, a, a strong army that, or army of strongs that he used to, 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 to beat the five kings. He was able to do that because he was wealthy. He had uh, cattle. He had everything, yet he did not go and buy a piece of land 
until he needed it to bury his wife, uh, Sarah. In contrast, let's see how Lot was living. In Genesis 13, 12, we read Abram, Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent towards toward Sodom. So at the beginning, Lot was copying or going with the flow, doing like his uncle is doing. What did he do? He lived in a tent, but sadly, when, they, when Abraham took him with him to Egypt, down to Egypt, he saw the civilization there and uh, a desire was created in his heart that the tent and living in a tent could not satisfy. So Genesis 13, 13, we see that Lot, after he uh, had that problem, this feud with Abraham, and they separated from each other, he went and pitched his tent towards Sodom, Sodom, although Sodom, he knew that Sodom had wicked men. Genesis 13, 13, but the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. This did not stop him. This did not bother him at all to pitch his tank, his tent towards Sodom. He will pay a dear price for that. We never read of an altar in the life of Lot. We know in the from the New Testament that Lot was uh, a believer. Yet we're talking about his lifestyle. There was no mention of. Uh, tent. There was no mention of uh, an altar. And later he will lose that tent that he used to live in. We know the story that Abraham, uh, that Lot was taken as a prisoner of war. And when Abraham heard that, he went to free Lot. And as a result, we see Lot gaining favor. After the victory, after Abraham's victory, the king of Sodom in uh, Genesis 14, 21, the king of Sodom went and said unto Ab Abraham, give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. Genesis 14, 22. And Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up mine hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the professor of heaven and earth, and he refused to take anything from him. But, so, but the king of Sodom knew that Lot is a very important man. He is the um, relative of the man who freed us, who freed us, who gained victory and refused at the end to take any, uh, any, anything any uh, price for what he has done. So we see that later, Lot, as a result, sits in the city gate. He does not sit in a tent anymore, but sits in a, in a favorable place, in a high place, like, let's say, a mayor or somebody with high status. Genesis 19, 1. And there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. So Lot sat in the city gate, the gate of the city, the most prominent place. And I'm sure he was very happy with that, uh, with that status. However, uh, 
the angels refused to initially to go and stay and to enter his uh, place of habitation and insisted to sleep in the yard rather than to go there and have fellowship with him with him but he pressed and insisted in genesis 19 3 and he pressed upon them greatly and they turned in unto him and entered his house and he made them a feast and did bake unleavened bread and they did eat so he invited them not to his tent lot is not living in a tent anymore he lives in a house this is what he saw when he went to egypt and his heart was uh, was had that desire to do as the Egyptians were doing that civilization, that's great civilization, he wanted to copy it, to copy it. Then the evil men came and said in 197, they wanted to take the men out. We know this story, but look at Lot addressing the evil men in Genesis 19, 7. He said to them and said, I pray you, brethren, do, do not so wickedly. He calls those evil men, those evil men who were ready to break his door and get his guests out to know them, to rape them. He is calling them brethren because he could not call them otherwise because yesterday, two days ago, that's what he was calling them with the full fellowship he had to have with them to gain that favor. How miserable and sad it is and how great is that price is to be in friendship with the Lord, with the world. This is a dear price to pay. He could not call them uh, evil men. He was pleading with them. He was begging them to let his, um, to let his guests, and even he tried to trade his two virgin daughters for those, uh, for his guests. Genesis 19, eight, behold now, I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you and do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing for therefore came they under the shadow of my roof it's a house and has a, that had a roof a roof genesis 19 10 but the men put forth their hand and pulled lot into the house to them and shut to the door it's a house that has a roof and has a door and this what had uh, lot wanted he had uh, social status and he had not a house not an altar not a sorry not a tent not an altar but he had a house a house a roof a door of course we know what happened to lot he is about to lose everything so they the two angels kept pressing him to leave to go out of that, uh, the, that city because that city is condemned and God will rain fire and brimstone and bring judgment to that, uh, that city. And he had to leave, but Lot, because of his sick heart, did not learn the lesson. He still asked 
to go to another city. And he tried to compromise by saying, I will go to a little city called Zoar. Zoar means a small, small. So they asked him to leave and go to the outside, but he still wants to be. And this is another characteristic of living a worldly life. Your, the heart, our hearts, our hearts become addicted to the world and want more and more and cannot live a life of uh, pilgrimage, <clears throat> excuse me, anymore because we act in a way as if we would be in that place forever. So Genesis 19, 16, and while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him, and they brought him forth and set him without the city. They brought him out. Verse 17, and it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad that he said, escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. This was not all right with Lot. Genesis 19, 18, and Lot son said unto them, oh, not so, my Lord. Genesis 19, 19, behold now thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life, and I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me, and I die. Verse 20, behold now, this city is near to flee unto, and it is a little one. Oh, let me escape thither is not a little one, and my soul shall live. And he said unto him, See, I have accepted thee concerning this thing also, that I will not overthrow the city for the which thou hast spoken. Genesis nineteen twenty two. Haste thee, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till thou be come thither. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zoar. Zoar means small. Lot had a prominent place. He had great fellowship with them, his brethren. That's what he called them. He, didn't, he doesn't live in a tent. He always preferred a city, even a little one. That's a compromise. That's why we are warned and admonished, and admonished, admonished, admonished not to love the world because it's a disease, it's a sickness. And once you get that sickness, only God can cure us and heal the heart that yearns after that, uh, that world. So we see that the world in all its wickedness did not stop Lot. And we see also that with all its riches, it did not attract the heart, Abraham's heart. Abraham, because of the altar, because the first thing he used to do is to build an altar. The first thing he used to do is to care for his relationship with God, to be, to be where the Lord is, that is his place. And this gave him some kind of satisfaction for the desire of the heart that he did not look for a city except that city that he will go to later. Being in that place where God has the headship, having a, a thriving 
and a healthy relationship with God is the only protection that we have from this world. If we let the heart wonder if we do not have an altar, the inevitable is to be addicted to that world and to be to yearn after it and to go and seek it. And the world will give prominence, will give stage status, he will give anything, he will give comfort and he will give everything to satisfy the lust of the heart and the eyes so that it would uh, make our senses not sensitive anymore. It will make our conscience a bit very difficult to find the right word hibernate to keep them to keep our conscience uh, at bay this is the danger of the world and loving the world and at the end it will be some kind of a reflection of Lot's life. At the end, Lot's family was destroyed. He lost his wife because she looked back. She was, her heart was set upon the city and she looked back. She became a pillar of, of uh, a pillar of salt. His two daughters, we know what she did, what they did to him, to their father, and the offspring of Lot since then until now are the most, are the enemies of the people of God, and even unto this day. It is a miserable, a miserable uh, destiny that he has chosen. And he thought that he has gained, actually, he has lost everything at the end. And this is the result of the enmity of, uh, this is the uh, result of the friendship of the world. All right. Now, to summarize what we have said, how should, uh, believer walk in this world. The best example that I have heard, and I would like to keep it with you and to end today's talk by it. It is like a damsel, a young girl, walking in the street where her fiance was slaughtered. How would she feel walking in that street? She has to walk in that street because that is the street that leads to her home. But every time she walks in that street, she remembers the love she had to her fiance and how she and how he was slaughtered. The prince of this world we know who he is. He has taken his place as a prince after the world has rejected the prince of peace and, and nailed him to a cross outside the camp. Every time we walk in the world, I speak to myself first, I should remember that this is the place where the bridegroom, the Prince of Peace, our love was killed, was slaughtered, was nailed to the cross and was executed in the worst possible, the worst possible uh, method of execution. I thank you for listening and 
uh, I'm ready if there is anybody who wants to add or to ask.